All right. I will start by elaborating on a comment from last time, namely that given a finite budget of perceptrons, it is you get more expressive power if you stack them in depth rather than in width. And uh, someone came to ask in the in the break and uh, gave a, exactly the uh, analogy that one of the most important papers in that direction has been making also, uh, namely that of uh, folding. Yeah. So um, in this paper by Montefiore and colleagues, um, we are looking at the remember the activation function it can be anything as long as it's nonlinear and here for the sake of argument uh, this absolute value is being used yeah. so uh, positive values remain unchanged negative inputs uh, are mapped to positive inputs and if we now have some feature space here with a and by the way, all of this today is in the public document, so you can, because you know there will be no formulas, there's no point in you painting all of this. Um, so if we now put a uh, perceptron down the middle of this feature space, then uh, any point that's, uh, let's say, at uh, this distance, uh, we'll get the same response as any point which is on the right-hand side at the same distance, etc. And so, uh, figuratively speaking, uh, we could say that this feature space is being folded along the vertical axis. Um, then, if we use a um, second perceptron, Let me restart this because I cannot get the fat pan that I want. Von das Dorf soll nicht sein. Okay, so viel bräuchte noch was. Denn diese Jalousien sind Fehlkonstruktionen und die hängen von irgendwo in der Kontrolle. Das macht nichts. Wir können ruhig ein bisschen. All right. Um, so, if we put a second perceptron in the same space, uh, thanks, down that axis, uh, this has the effect of folding along the horizontal axis. So that if I now have these two perceptrons, both with uh, this absolute value activation function, it is like folding once along the vertical, once along the horizontal axis. <laughs> and uh, so we have altogether mapped four distinct points onto one. So let's say uh, these four points here have been mapped onto the same coordinate in the higher dimensional space. And uh, if we do that twice, um, so here's an example of a two-layer perceptron. So we you know the thing that we've uh, drawn many times. I uh, have uh, summation units. Uh, the activations this time are these absolute value functions. We had two inputs. The inputs were x1 and x2. This would be the first layer. And uh, then we repeat the same thing. for a second layer here, and we get two outputs. And uh, these outputs, uh, let's call them, uh, I don't know, Z1 and Z2, uh, those are the ones shown here. This would be Z1, and this would be Z2. Um, so let's say that uh, if in this uh, final space we are using a perceptron, a single one, maybe with a step function here, okay, to uh, make a classification, um, then, uh, and let's put the perception, let's position it like this. Huh? So let's say we would perhaps uh, predict uh, maybe the positive class, uh, 
on that side of the perceptron and let's say the negative class over there. If we uh, look at uh, where in the previous space points are being mapped, mapped to positive or negative, then we would have uh, positive, 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 positive here, and then, uh, well, negative for all of the insides. Okay? And uh, then we can look in the very original space uh, where, this, uh, where these points came from, and uh, then we ultimately find um, these decision boundaries that you see here. And uh, inside we have uh, the negative class. And outside we have the positive class throughout. Okay, let's look at this uh, budget. We have used altogether five perceptrons and we have ended up with four distinct regions. And if we had tried to do that directly, so by using four perceptrons in the first layer and just one perceptron in the second layer, we would not have managed to get such a complicated decision boundary out. Now this is of course a toy example. Um, this toy example would work well if indeed uh, you know the negative class in feature space is here, 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 and here, and the positive class is elsewhere, but I think it makes the point nicely. Yeah? So uh, you can uh, think of um, the layers of a perception of somehow folding or warping um, the space and you gain overall more nonlinearity by accepting, uh, by giving the output of one perception as input to the next. You get more nonlinearity than if you just uh, stack them in width. That means if you just have very many perceptrons in a single feature space. Good, so this is Montufar. Um, I think it was around 2014. And uh, they also give a formula for uh, the number of uh, linear regions you can expect for a ReLU network uh, as a function of width and depth. Good. So this is an uh, answer to the question, why do we want to go deep rather than wide? Okay. Up next, why convolutional? Um, well, you know, convolutional neural networks are the thing that really works best. Yeah? So um, other types of networks, um, other types of networks have been proposed. Um, so, for example, um, we have uh, recurrent networks. Uh, we have. Uh, we have networks with differentiable memory. Um, we have networks um, that are not of the feed-forward type that we've seen here at all, but we, we have uh, spiking networks. Um, as you know, in this building, and new one being constructed <coughs> next doors, um, there are labs working on neuromorphic computing where one perceptron sends information to the next, not in terms of numbers, as we have done here, but by sending spikes. So there are many, many, many architectures out there, uh, but the workhorse, the thing that really works uh, very reliably and that can be trained reliably uh, are the feed-forward convolutional neural networks. And um, they work, well, not on arbitrary data, um, they work on data which has a temporal or a spatial structure, which happens to be much of the data that we as humans are, are interested in. Yeah? So not all data sets in the world have this temporal or spatial structure, but um, making sense of images, making sense of uh, recordings, of sounds, um, that is you know, a major, uh, if you've solved these tasks, then, then you've covered a lot of ground. Um, so computer vision, I've given you examples earlier, you know, like this uh, autonomous driving, for example, this is needed. Or, uh, well, when you, you know, when you speak into your phone because you don't want to type the message, um, then um, I'm, I'm surprised how well this works nowadays, even though there's a lot of background noise or, or music or so, or lots of other people talking in the room. Um, so the, the best 
performing method or close to best performing methods are always convolutional neural networks. Yeah? So uh, here I want to explain you know, uh, what, what does that mean yeah? and, and why do they work. Um, okay, so provocatively I'm saying uh, why do they work? Because images look like on the left hand side and not like on the right hand side. On the right hand side this is not a random image, um, it is just a permutation of all pixels. Okay, so um, the histogram is perfectly identical. And if we wanted to do computer vision by just using a multilayer perceptron, then, you know, to a multilayer perceptron, um, let's say all of this is the input. Uh, let's say we connect all of the pixels to a perceptron. Um, to the perceptron, it makes no difference if we use this representation or if we use that representation. You know, they're equally good. Yeah. Um, but, um, ah, this is an experiment I should have done maybe. Um, if we now shift around uh, the monkey a little bit, you know, to us, tiny shifts will even be indiscernible. Um, so I would have to show you the difference image to show that, yes, actually I shifted the monkey to the left by one pixel. Whereas on the right hand side, the permuted image um, would look a lot more different. Yeah? So uh, uh, the representation on the right hand side is not close to having this invariance which we have built into our visual system. All right, um, so for sake of argument, uh, let's consider a 1D time series or a 1D image. Um, previously, um, when I showed a perceptron, I've always uh, shown these inputs as, you know, these small nodes, and they were connected to this uh, perceptron here. Um, to make it look a little bit more like an image, um, this time, you know, if you look closely, there is a perceptron here. Um, but this time I've not shown these individual nodes, I've just uh, indicated here a, a 1D array, uh, so 10 numbers. Um, think of it as a time series of length 10, a scalar time series of length 10, or think of it as uh, one column in an image, uh, which is just 10 pixels long, okay? So it's a, it's a fairly small image. Now, if we just did the plain multi-layer perceptron thing, then we would now build perceptrons. Um, and let's say we want to have as many outputs as inputs. For example, a typical task, I'll show you pictures later on, is uh, semantic segmentation. That means for each pixel and image, I want to decide which class is that pixel. So in a in a street view, I'm interested in is this pixel road or person or car, uh, or is it you know, drivable surface, non-drivable surface, questions like this. Uh, in questions like this, we have as many outputs as inputs. So if these are 10 input pixels, then maybe I want to classify drivable or non-drivable for each of the 10 pixels, that would be my output. Now this would be the first layer of a multi-layer perceptron, and I could have more layers uh, to the right. But in this first layer, for 10 inputs and 10 outputs, I would here have 10 perceptrons. And I didn't want to draw them all because it would have gotten um, very messy. But in principle, each of these perceptrons is connected to all of the inputs. So we can count the number of parameters. Um, if each perceptron has 10 inputs, and I omitted the bias here, and I have 10 perceptrons, well, I get 100 parameters. Uh, if I do this with a proper image, you know, a fairly small one, let's say one megapixel, um, then this single layer of a multilayer perceptron would have, well, a thousand billion parameters. Okay, um, so more than you have training data, very probably. Um, or more generally speaking, in input samples and output samples, we have n squared parameters, and with the kind of inputs we're dealing, these are um, very quickly, very large numbers. So we have a problem. Now, um, the first thing you can do is uh, decide that, all right, if this perceptron here is to make a prediction on the nature of this output pixel, 
whether it is drivable or non-drivable surface, let's say. Um, maybe this single perceptron doesn't have to look at the whole image. Maybe it's okay if it just looks at uh, a local vicinity. You know? Maybe it's enough if it just looks, let's say, at the first three pixels. So instead of a fully connected layer, we then get a locally connected layer. In this case, uh, ignoring boundary effects, um, I have uh, pretended that each perceptron gets connected to three of the pixels. Well, and if we do want to discuss boundary effects, uh, then actually I would have had to draw it a little bit differently. Uh, the third input here, you know, I have to decide what to do. I can, for example, just a zero pad. That would be my third input. Um, and I would do that, of course, for each other perceptron in between. So for the perceptron mapping here, it would get these three inputs. So number of parameters this time is no longer n squared. Um, this would be three n parameters. Um, this is quite doable. Um, however, we are in this way forcing our system, if these parameters are not constrained to be identical, um, I'm forcing the system to reinvent the wheel all of the time. So let's say, uh, one perceptron becomes good at distinguishing if something is road or not. Maybe it just looks you know, at the color and texture of the three by three pixels locally. Uh, and if it's gray, then it's maybe road. And if it's uh, red, it's probably not road, something like that. Um, but then the perceptron, which is responsible for the adjacent output, would have to come up with its own rule, which probably would be very similar. Yeah. And uh, so then, you know, why not force these rules to be identical in the first place? We could either do this by regularization. We could say that um, if we look at the parameters, so maybe the first parameter, okay, let, let me call this weight here um, 7, 1. Uh, it belongs to the seventh perceptron, and it's the first weight of the seventh perceptron. And this here would be the weight uh, 10, 1. Yeah, it would be the tenth perceptron, but again, the first weight. I could, for example, using a sort of ridge penalty, um, encourage uh, near the weights of nearby perceptrons to be similar but not identical. That would work, um, but in practice, we do something simpler still, namely we, we simply enforce weight sharing. So um, if you now look at, uh, so the sketch looks the same as it did before. Um, okay, let me correct for the boundary effects here. Uh, we said uh, W1 should be here and W2 there and W3 just gets a zero which we hallucinate. And there, similarly, we have W1, W2, and W3. And uh, now, you see, before I had two indices. Uh, one index told me which perception I'm talking about. And the other told me which weight of the perceptron I'm talking about. And now I've lost the index for the perceptrons, making them all identical. So all perceptrons now use the identical set of weights. And uh, mathematically speaking, so the linear part, so if I look at the result here before the nonlinearity, uh, mathematically speaking, that's a convolution. Hence, convolutional neural networks. Now, number of parameters this time for this first layer of my multi-layer perceptron is three. Okay, compare that to the thousand billion we had earlier. So um, clearly, uh, that helps in reducing number of parameters. And I mentioned last time that fundamentally we usually have the problem of too many parameters and too little training data. So this is of course a very appropriate means to reduce number of parameters. At the same time, it's of course a huge restriction 
Yeah? So uh, that means we will probably, you know, if I only used that as a first layer of my multilayer perceptron, and then did something, you know, and then I use a hundred more layers on top. But if the hundred further layers never see the original input, but just see the output of this first layer, then uh, the rest of the neural network would have to look through a tiny keyhole, if you like, or through a very special set of glasses at the raw data. So let me give you an example. Uh, let's say this filter is a high pass filter. Yeah, so maybe the neural network has learned that it's a good idea um, to use weights which are, let's say, plus one, which are zero, and which are minus one. Yeah, so this is a finite difference operator. It is an approximation uh, to the <coughs> gradient in the image. Um, now this is, on one hand, it's fine, you know, because it brings out uh, intensity edges. And edges are a very salient feature in images. So we, we know that we use that a lot in, in our biological system, and the whole animal world does. And if we look at the way it's learned by neural networks, we see that they also learn edge detectors. That's an important feature. But um, as you know, the derivative, uh, it cancels, uh, well, it cancels constant offsets. And it also cancels. Um, the low frequency variations, so where an image is bright and not bright. Yeah? So what I would get, what I would get out from my first layer is um, a feature map which tells me where the edges are in the image, but I've lost the information of, uh, you know, inside the the edge and outside the edge. So inside the object and outside the object, what were the relative brightnesses? You know, was the thing inside the edge, was it bright or was it dark? Yeah? Or how bright was it? Um, so we don't want to be so restrictive. And as a consequence, um, well, we stay in the same layer of the neural network, but we generate more feature maps. So let me use a different color here. Um, let's say I'm generating a second set of outputs here. No matter how I'm going to draw, it's going to be messy. Uh, I'm drawing it side by side here. And now I have a second uh, set of perceptrons, again with identical weights. They take the same inputs. So the first one takes the first three pixels. But they map their output here to this second channel. And so these things here are called uh, channels or feature maps. And there are other names. So this is completely identical? Um, the, no. I mean, the question is, was it completely identical? So um, the black and the green perceptron have different weights. So maybe the green perceptron has weights, uh, oh, OK, let me draw it somewhere here. Um, I'm drawing you a green perceptron somewhere in the middle, green. And this maps, let's say, here. Uh, perhaps the weights this time are uh, plus 1 half, plus 1, plus 1 half, for example. This would be a low pass filter. Yeah, so the first set of weights I gave <coughs> was a high pass filter. It was an approximation to the derivative of an image. Um, this is a low pass filter. This is, uh, you know, smoothing the image. So now I would get two channels. One has highlighted all the edges in the original image. The second channel um, has smoothed the original image. So the weights between the black perceptrons are identical. The weights between the green perceptrons are identical. But the black and the green perceptrons have different weights. Uh, moreover, if I miss, you know, to your question, uh, of course, the numbers that we find in this output vectors are also, in general, all different, because I'm expecting the input numbers to be different. All right. Now, um, 
cumulatively, um, this thing here would be one layer of a deep network um, because all of these perceptrons, the, the black and the green ones, because they get to see the same input. So now if I have now another uh, sets of perceptrons, uh, which this time, uh, you know, let me draw a blue one here. Uh, so now this has weights or it takes input from both channels. Yeah? So now I don't have three weights, but I have six weights. And it has an activation and it produces an output. And let's do uh, another one. I need a different color. Uh, I can have another set of perceptrons. They take the same inputs. So they don't see the original image, but they see the result from the previous layer. Again, six input weights, and the result is mapped here. Um, these would again be called one layer, because all of these perceptrons work on the same input. And traditionally, in your networks, we have had this sequence of layers, where each layer just sees the input from, or, or only gets to see the output of the previous layer as its input. Now, in recent years, um, this has changed because uh, um, empirically it has been found that actually it's a good idea to let these later perceptrons also see more of the raw data or see more what the opinion of earlier layers was. So we have so-called skip links um, or residual connections um, where perceptrons get to see not just the previous layer, but layers before that. All right. Um, now, what's a typical number for a number of layers? Of course, this answer um, you know, is a monotonically increasing function of, of the date. Um, but um, you know, a decent network nowadays would have dozens of layers. And then how many channels per layer? Uh, well, it depends where in the network you are, and I'll give you examples later, but typical numbers of channels uh, could be um, something between, let's say, 16 channels, where we have a lot of spatial resolution, and uh, 4,000 channels, uh, where we have low or no spatial resolution, just to give you an idea. Okay. Now, when I say convolution, um, it's important to note that uh, convolution is only across the spatial dimensions, not across the channels. I've tried to be concrete here. Um, you know, rather than draw these boxes here, uh, I've now said the, uh, the input was an image. And now somewhere in my network, I have a representation of the image, which is uh, 128 by 128 for width and height. And here, you know, I've used 10 channels as an example. Now, a perceptron from the next layer would use a, uh, a perceptron, if I now want to create an, uh, a perceptron that produces one channel in the next layer, Um, this perceptron sees uh, typically, you know, a fairly small uh, part in space, so something like uh, maybe three by three pixels, uh, but it gets to see all the previous channels at once. Yeah? So I've tried to indicate this with the box. Yeah? So up here, you see I said uh, the, the green perceptron uh, has as inputs, uh, if it uses filter size of three, and there are two channels, and it has six inputs. 
And this time I've tried to show you in, sh in the shape of a box what this input would look like. It would be 3 by 3 by 10. And that means uh, that we do convolution only across space, but not across, uh, so typically, not across the channel dimension. Okay, so um, the perceptron does not see 3 by 3 by 1 and then convolve in space and across channels, but uh, what, I'm, what I've shown you here would be a typical connectivity pattern. All right, this would be, uh, so in this case, uh, here we would have 90 parameters for the perceptron that generates us this particular channel. And then, of course, uh, as before, we have many perceptrons uh, that uh, give us many channels, which collectively I've shown on the left-hand side as a box or as a tensor, if you like. So, convolutional networks. We've looked at why and how. Yes? Yes? Well, if I have the output dimension, um, can you answer yourself? So let's do this a bit prettier. Yeah, this is the summation unit. It has weights, which I'm here showing cumulatively yeah, in terms of this box. And then it has uh, activation. And then it writes its output uh, you know, at the same spatial location where the inputs were. So what's the size of the output overall? Well, if I use a single kind of perceptron, it's just no. Can you make the analogy, you know, up, up here? The perceptrons up there also only had three weights. And yet the output was not of, was not of size, three. Yeah? This is obviously an eight, but yes, you're right. Yeah. So uh, 128 by 128 would be the output for a single kind of convolutional perceptron. Okay, you're talking about the boundary effects. Ah, you, you've been reading my eight correctly, and you've been discussing the boundary effects. There's a clever guy. Okay, good. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, um, so, uh, okay, you are alluding to this. Uh, here to this corner case of uh, what if the perceptron tries to look outside the image. Um, there are a few choices in signal processing. Um, one is to just extend the image with zeros. This would be called zero padding, and it obviously has a bias. Uh, another choice is to mirror the image. Um, that's a fairly good choice. Um, or you can uh, only uh, compute the quote-unquote valid convolution, so only compute those results uh, where you're not contaminated by boundary effects, and then uh, you lose, for each of these convolutions, a few pixels at the, at the borders. Okay, but if we ignore it for now, and if we say uh, we zero pad, then if the input was 128 by 128 by 10, then the output would be 128 by 128 by 1 for one kind of convolutional perceptron, one channel. No? And if we now add a next kind of perceptron, it gets to see the same input but uses different weights. Then we get here a second output channel and so on. All right, more questions? Yeah? Um, what do we mean by saying we use different ways when it comes to training? Do we not just use backpropagation then? 
different ways. Different ways for the two different channels. Ah. So how can we ensure that they are different? Okay. Um, how can we ensure that the weights that we find are different? Um, we start the training by randomly initializing the weights and uh, then just do backprop. Uh, and depending on the random initialization, depending on the trading set, depending on the architecture, we will end up with different weights. Um, having said that, um, in many, so nowadays, you know, usually when you start working with these problems, you also have a big enough GPU that you can just train from scratch. In principle, you can also, um, you know, usually you want to do something fancy at the end or you want to change the output. You can also use uh, weights that were obtained from a different network, even with a different task. Uh, so uh, let's say, yeah, if you want to, uh, if you want to train a pet detector, uh, then if you have a network that has been uh, trained on cars, then that will already be better than, uh, you know, starting from random initialization. But on the other hand, uh, you might get caught in a not so fantastic local optimum. So um, I would say, you know, a few years back when GPUs were still slower and more expensive, people didn't have as many. Um, that was a big deal that you could reuse weights from other pre-trained networks. Uh, I would say nowadays, uh, my impression is that the, the practice is to, to start training from scratch. More questions? Okay, so those were the principles of a convolutional network. Let's look at uh, concrete architectures. Um, the first one that I want to show is called VGG16, and it was designed for an image classification task. Uh, first, what is image classification? The input is an image, and the output is uh, one hot vector uh, telling which objects you think are present in the image. Now, if you work on a, on a data set like ImageNet, there are a thousand classes, and hence your one hot vector needs, to, or your the vector encoding result needs to have a thousand elements. Um, but highlighted here are uh, a few examples, not from the VGG16 paper, but from the famous AlexNet paper, which uh, marked the return of neural networks to computer vision and uh, you know, the, the victorious homecoming of neural networks in computer vision. And uh, on the top are uh, you know, good examples, and on the bottom are uh, cherry-picked failure cases. What I mean by that is uh, you know, the authors show failure cases where they want to say, you know, really, it's not a failure at all. Okay, um, so let's look at the top. Um, it's difficult to show in a small figure one like this a vector with a thousand entries. So shown here are on the one hand the ground truth. So this picture, the ground truth was this picture has a mite, and then the uh, the strongest outputs of the network are shown in terms of these histograms. Yeah, so the network thinks uh, it's somewhat confident it's a mite. It thinks it could also be a black widow or a cockroach or a tick or a starfish. Uh, but it, it claims mite because mite is the strongest response. Then here, you know, ground truth is container ship and network predicts container ship. On the right hand side, ground truth is leopard, network predicts leopard. And you know, what's pretty nice is that if the network thinks, if it's not a leopard, it could be a jaguar or a cheetah or a snow leopard. So, so it doesn't think, yeah, and it could be a car or could be this or could be that. Yeah? 
all right, now the so-called uh, the cherry-picked failure cases. Um, here, the network thinks it's a convertible, but the ground truth was grill, not a cooler, grill or something. Uh, here, the network thought it saw a dog, but the ground truth has been that these are cherries. And you see, you know, so the sort of ground truth has its uh, fallacies uh, or, or can be tricky also. Good. So this this is the task of image classification. And now the VTG16 architecture. So the uh, images are scaled. You know, either you take a crop of this size or you scale the image to have that size. 224 by 224 times 3. The 3 is for the red, green, and blue channel of the color image. Now, um, we have, from here to here, we have 64 different kinds of perceptrons. So in my pictures, I've always drawn two kinds of perceptrons, convolutional ones. Here, we use 64 kinds of convolutional perceptrons. Uh, giving 64 output channels. And, you know, the picture is not drawn quite to scale. So this box here, the thin one, it should really be, well, you know, it's it's drawn here too flat. Yeah? I mean, if, if the width and height is 224, then if we plotted the 64 channels correctly, if we made isotropic voxels, then uh, this would be a much bigger box or a, a thicker box, let's say. Um, then there are a further 64 kinds of convolutional perceptrons and their nonlinear activations, which take us from here to there. Now, in the very end, we want to end up with uh, this uh, 1,000 dimensional uh, vector encoding which of the classes do we think is in the image. So somewhere between the image and the output, we need to progressively reduce the spatial dimensionality, and this is what's happening here. Yeah, so from from here to there, um, there is a, a red stage, which uh, this picture is uh, marked as, as max pooling. A max pooling, you know, the name says it all. It's an operator that looks at a tiny window, uh, maybe three by three pixels, and only passes on or in this example here, uh, it's a two by two window, and uh, it looks at the four values it finds in this two by two window and passes on just the biggest of these. So clearly there's a loss of information, but it's on the one hand a useful nonlinearity, and on the other hand it helps reduce spatial dimension. It's also an operation that uh, gradient can be propagated through for the back propagation. Now, by the way, out of these four numbers, just one gets forwarded, so the gradient that we get will only then be branched along that winning input. Yeah, but still, gradient can be sent through. So that's the max pooling thing. And uh, then come now 128 types of convolutional perceptrons <coughs> and nonlinear activations, and another 128 times of convolutional perceptrons. So you see, we sacrificed spatial resolution, but you know here we went from three channels to 64, and now we went from 64 channels to 128. Uh, so you see this trade-off. Uh, this network is reducing the spatial resolution, and at the same time, it's using more and more channels to somehow you know preserve the information or represent what's in the image. And then the same thing happens again, you know, another max pooling stage, and uh, now the number of channels is doubled again. Uh, and this goes on and on until um, here, you know, this was 14 by 14. If I did a max pool of 14 by 14, usually I should end up with 7 by 7, but instead uh, I end up with a 1 by 1. Uh, so here, a max pool across a bigger window was being used. So, so here, a max pool not of size 2 by 2, but of size 14 by 14 was used to produce uh, actually this result here. Yeah? So this would be, um, oh, OK, it is actually 7 by 7 by 5, 12. I apologize. OK, good. Sorry. Um, and now comes a proper multilayer perceptron. Yeah? So 
um, now we have uh, here uh, 4096 perceptrons and each of the perceptron gets this entire thing as input and produces a single output. But 4096 distinct types of perceptrons. And uh, then in the next layer there is another 4096 distinct types of perceptrons which this time see all of the inputs or which see all of the output from the previous layer. So we have 4096 perceptrons, each one of which sees 4096 inputs. So actually there's a lot of parameters. If we, if we think, you know, where are the parameters hidden in the network, uh, there's a lot of parameters here in this innocuous uh, end of the network. So this is called uh, fully connected. Yeah? And uh, then in the end there are uh, 1000 perceptrons in this final so these, we are now in 4096 dimensional space. Now we, we put 1000 perceptrons in this 4096 dimensional space. Each perceptron votes for one class. And then there's the softmax operation that I mentioned last time, which normalizes it or, or brings the responses back um, to the zero one cube. And uh, so the final thing, this one by 1000 vector is the prediction of the network regarding which classes are present in it. Good. This is by uh, Karan Simonian and Ruth Sisserman from um, the Visual Geometry Group, hence VGG uh, in Oxford. Um, and if you want to, well, encode something like that, you know, in, in one of these high-level frameworks, uh, there is a language which makes it pretty simple to uh, define standard networks like this one. Yeah, so here we would see that uh, we have 2D convolutions in the first layer. Uh, we want 64 distinct types of perceptrons and they have a spatial dimension or the size of the weight mask is 3 by 3. Yeah. And, uh, and actually there are two of these layers, one after the other. And uh, then comes uh, the max pooling operation and so on. So this is sort of a convenience language which makes it simple to specify a network such as a simple network, a simple architecture such as this one. All right, any questions? Yeah. Um, in ImageNet, I think it was a million images that was used. And uh, there are at least a few hundred representatives of each single class. Yeah, if we look at why do networks work nowadays and not 20 years ago, it's, uh, it's the GPUs, it's certain tricks like uh, rectifying linear unit, uh, and it's the amount of training data. Yeah. Why do we want to use uh, max pooling instead of something like the mean where the propagate changes back to all of the distance? Mm -hmm. Why use max pool and not mean? That's a good question. Um, so max pool in itself is a non is a nonlinear operator and nonlinearity is good. Uh, but on the other hand, um, you know, you are, you are right in that max pooling has gone a bit out of fashion. Um, so the way one would do it nowadays is um, rather by um, subsampling uh, a convolutional map um, and to not waste computations, you don't first compute it and then subsample, but you um, immediately um, use something which is called, what is it, transpose something? Transpose? Yeah, so there, there are multiple versions that you could do. You could, for example, do the equivalent of the transpose map, but then you could see that we that look at every 3 by 3 text, for example, to say they always take one larger step, so they don't have the problem. And like you see, new spatial resolution, and you do everything like that. But your average cooling is actually something that is also used, for example, you often see 
not in the early days, but in the last day of the week, and the 7 by 7 by 500 volts, that you would have an average cooling over those 7 by 7 by 500 volts, which drops into 1 by 1 by 500 volts, and you continue from there. Um, but yeah, basically, all the methods are available, and some are for some problems, and some for others, and there's still no good theory why you should use one. And w thanks, Manuel. What is the transpose thing properly called that I mentioned? Uh, transpose something. Um, yeah. So, so the thing is, if if I take this picture here, yeah. So we have these one-dimensional signals, and uh, if I now want to get a uh, the same an output of the same size then my linear filter, or my, my convolution, I can represent as a matrix vector multiplication, where this matrix has special properties. Yeah? This is a triplets matrix, um, so the entries uh, along diagonals are identical. And uh, well, if I only use a 3 by 3 matrix, uh, or here, in this case, it was a 1D signal. So if I only use three coefficients, then most of this matrix is 0. Yeah? So this would be the linear part of the perceptron if I want to have the same size of output. And now, rather than use a square matrix, um, I can, well, you know what's fixed is this dimension of the matrix. But the other dimension, you know, I could make it um, smaller. And that would give me a downsampling. Or I could make it uh, larger. And that will give me a, an upsampling. Yeah. And then you still have something like uh, this, well, a property similar to the triplets. It's just that uh, you don't find the identical weight along the diagonals, but, but along uh, you know, lines which have a different, uh, which have a different slope. Good. So um, those were convolutional nets and the, and the first architecture. Uh, let's have a break and then talk about more architectures and tricks, etc. Ten minute break. Okay.